Hey, good morning. How are y'all today? Oh, come on. Y'all got to sleep in. How are y'all today? There we go. Hey, we are so glad that you are joining us here at our Paradise Campus. And if you are watching online, we are thankful that you are tuning in. And we would love it if you would take a moment to hit that share button and share this service with your friends. If you are new to Grace, we would be honored if you would take a minute to scan this cool little QR code that's in the back, uh, in the seat back in front of you. Or if you are online, you can click the link in the chat box. And guys, it's just a simple way for us to connect with you and answer any questions that you may have. Through this same QR code or the link, you can quickly find information about kids ministry, students ministry, next steps, and upcoming events like kids camps, student camps, mission trips, and more. And speaking of exciting events in the life of our church, we have an event coming up called Married Life Live with Ted Lowe. Y'all, this is happening on Sunday, April 11th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Child care from birth through fifth grade is included. I'm gonna repeat that for y'all. Child care from birth to fifth grade is included. It's $20 a couple, $15 for, it, for individuals. And y'all, it is going to be an awesome event. For more information, or to register, you can go to gf.church slash links or scan the QR code if you are here in the audience. Y'all, it's going to be an incredible morning here at Grace. Let's stand and join together as we sing. Oh, 
together. Come on, we're going to keep praising him as one church. We're all going to raise up.
to trust you in the midst of fear, trust you in the midst of doubt. God, and we just want to praise your name for what you brought us through. God, we know that it's for a purpose that everybody in this room is here today in this moment. God, and that you are good and you are fighting for us every step of the way, God. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all may have a seat. What an incredible time of celebration of the fact that we have such a faithful, faithful God. I don't know about y'all, but I love the music that we sing here at Grace. And another thing that I love about Grace is seeing all of the ways that we are reaching into our communities and beyond. We believe that God has positioned us here to do this work. And it's because of your generosity that we can continue to do ministry. If you would like to partner with us, you can go to gf.church slash give or you can give on your church center app. And if you're here with us in the audience, you can also scan that QR code or you can use the generosity boxes located in the auditorium. Today, Pastor Rocky will continue the story of Moses in our series called Impossible. We hope that you are both encouraged and challenged by today's message.
Christ who told me. Woo, welcome to Grace Fellowship. How are y'all doing today? Good, good. I'm glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, thank you for allowing us to be part of your weekend. Uh, we are in the series uh, Impossible. And uh, before we jump in, there, let me just kind of tell you a little about what something happened here recently in my life and maybe just uh, get to know me a little bit better. Um, about three weeks ago, I, I kind of felt the need that my energy level was a little low. So I started um, watching my uh, carbohydrate and sugar intake. Okay. Now, I think carbohydrate and sugar are the same thing, but we, I'm not that smart on that stuff. So anyway, and, and it was mostly for my energy level. I was just feeling kind of blah, not because I needed a diet, because look at me, dude, I'm, I'm one step away from being a model. I know. So, but anyway, it, it was for my energy intake or for, cause I needed energy. So I was watching one, I was doing great for two to three weeks. It was amazing. And, and we got invited over to some friend's house. Me and my wife got invited over to some friend's house to eat dinner. And, and, and they're the Fontenot's. They're a friends, they're called, the, they're the names of Fontenot's. And if you're anything, know anything about Louisiana, Fontenot is synonymous with great food. All right. And so we went over to the Fontenot's house and they had jambalaya and cornbread. Okay. Now let me tell you, this is not just any cornbread. This was crawfish cornbread. Okay. It was amazing. All right. It was so good. It had, it had corn in it, cheese and, and, and crawfish and had jalapenos in it. And I'm telling you guys, I'm just having a moment right here. Um, the cornbread quickly became the entree and the jambalaya became the side dish. All right. And I had seconds on the cornbread and then I actually had a little bit more for dessert. And, and, and if I hadn't had any carbs for like three weeks and you could imagine what happened. Oh my gosh. I went into a carb coma just like this. And I was just, oh, I was yawning and everything like that. And finally we got home and, and it was just, I was like, I got a shower and I just crashed, crashed into bed. It hit, hit, that just hit a, about that size, I hit a wall about that size. And it was, but it was worth it. It was worth it, man. It was so good. You know, and we have those walls in our life all the time. We have walls that we hit. It could be, it could be a wall that you, maybe you've plateaued in an exercise program, or maybe it's, maybe it's a wall in um, uh, just a relationship that you have. Maybe you've got a problem at work and you've been trying to solve it and you can't, get, you just can't solve it. And it's just, you've tried and tried and tried and all of a sudden you just come up against the wall and there's no other solution. Uh, maybe you're the, the wall is your job. You finally realized, Hey, it's a, I'm just not going anywhere in this thing. It's just a dead end job. And it's just, and that's the wall you faced, or maybe just not able to get a job. Maybe the wall or uh, it's medical expenses, an upside down car note, whatever it may be. We all have these walls in our life. We have them, we hit them all the time. And, 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 and if you're, whether you're in a, hitting a wall right now or you're about to hit a wall, we just have them. And, and, and these, walls are, these walls are pretty much, um, there's several reasons why we can have a wall in our life. One is those things, you, just, you made bad decisions and you're dealing with the consequences. And, and there's, and it's, it's all you, it's not anybody else. You have issues you've worked through that you're working on. You have a wall in your life because of bad decisions that you've made, or you have a wall in your life because of decisions that other people made and they affected you. But what if, what if the wall in your life was there on purpose? Not only was it there on purpose, but what if God built the wall? What if God put the wall there? Not only did he put the wall there, but he led you to the wall. And you've done everything you're supposed to do, and all of a sudden, you're up against a wall. You're facing that wall in your life. For the last couple of weeks, we've been diving into the life of Moses. And I hope, I hope you've uh, had the last two um, sermons. And if you haven't, I'd, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to at gf.church slash watch the great messages. Um, but Moses was just, he was an amazing leader, but he was just like you and me. He messed up, he made mistakes, and God, but God still used him in a crazy great way. And a couple of weeks ago, Corbin talked about how God protected Moses when he was born for his future calling. And this is what uh, Corbin said, no matter what happens around you, God has a plan for you. And, and then last week, Jeremy told the story about how Moses was, um, he made a, a terrible life choice and he killed an Egyptian. 
And, in, and because he killed an Egyptian, he had to go hide and he had to go out into the wilderness. And, he, and when he went out there, he, he went out there and ended up finding, working for his father-in-law. He got married and was working for his father-in-law for 40 years watching sheep. And, and after that 40 years, he had an experience. He saw a bush that was on fire and he and God had a dialogue. And God was saying, I want you to go back to Egypt. Um, despite what has happened, the choice that you've made, I want you to go back to Egypt and lead my people out. And today we're going to pick up kind of a little bit past that about another experience in, in Moses' life that I feel like is probably one of the most popular ones um, that, that we hear the story of. But if you, if you haven't, if you don't know a whole lot about Moses, even if you do, I would encourage you, man, get your Bible and read Exodus. Exodus, Moses, there's so much more about Moses than what we're covering in four sermons, okay? So I'd encourage you to go and read that. But here, let me just kind of pick up with what happened after, after Jeremy. Um, Moses was asking a lot of questions and he finally just said, okay, I'll go. And he went in, he went and he had to persuade the Israelites to follow him, that he was their leader. Um, and then he also had to persuade Pharaoh to let the people go. And, um, and, and, and both of those were a pretty big challenge, but after, um, for the, for the Pharaoh, it was, I mean, if you've read it, you know, it was, there was a bunch of gnats. Okay. There was a bunch of frogs. There was a bunch of locusts. Okay. And all the bugs and stuff like there's somebody going, Ugh. and I mean, when they were around, they were around, you couldn't step without stepping on them. They were everywhere. Okay. And the Nile and all the water turned to blood. There was giant hell that killed everything. Livestock died. And ultimately the final thing was that all the firstborn in Egypt were died one night. And Pharaoh finally got to the point, he said, okay, Moses, take these people out. Just leave us alone and go. And so Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and they started their journey and, and they haven't been far in their journey. And then that's where we're going to pick up in Exodus 14, one through four. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses, order the Israelites to turn back and camp by. Okay, now I'm going to stop right there because this is a cool thing. You don't know how to pronounce it either. <laughs> so however I pronounce it, you're going to say, that's the right pronunciation. All right. So I'm just going to pronounce it and you're going to say, oh, good job, Rocky. Okay. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Piharoth. Now I'm going to say it again in a minute and I'll say it totally different. Um, between Migdal and the sea, camp there along the shore across from Belzephon. Then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. They've been walking for a little while, not long. And they get to a place and, 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 and God tells Moses to go camp over there. Go camp over there. Now I have a couple of questions for you. Who's leading the Israelites out of Egypt? Good answer, but who's the person? Moses, okay? Moses is leading the people out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt. He's leading the Israelites out of Egypt. But who is leading Moses? God, bingo. He's leading, God's leading Moses. And they get to this point and he says, go back, not go forward. Go back to this area between the Migdal and the sea and I want you to camp there. I want you to camp there. And, 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 and when you're camped there up against the wall of the sea, I'm going to persuade Pharaoh to come after you. Okay, let's think about that. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're following Moses. You're doing what, and God says, go over here and I want you to camp over here. And while you're camped over there, I'm going to bring the Egyptians after you again. He led the people to a place of helplessness and hopelessness. He led the people to a impossible wall and they were doing everything that they were supposed to be doing. Everything that they were supposed to be doing. We face walls all the time. Sometimes the wall is by our choice, by mistake we made. Sometimes by somebody else's mistake. But sometime, sometime the wall in our life that we face is because God led us there. Because God led us to that wall. Listen to this statement. God often leads us to a wall. This is hard for us to think. It's hard for us to find. Look at this real quick, this scripture. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Piharoth between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from Belzephon. 
okay? So Moses is leading the people. And God says, go back and camp there. Go back to the wall and camp there. Camp there where you don't have any other options. Camp over there because you have, there, there, you have a, a wall that you're facing. It's a sea and you have no options. And I struggle with this, guys. I really do. I struggle with this for this very reason. If I'm being obedient to God, why is he leading me to a wall? If I'm holding up my end of the bargain, why isn't God holding up his end? If I'm doing what's right, why is God not coming through for me? I struggle with that. I'm doing my part. You do your part. Maybe you think of people that you work with or people that you've been around before, and it seems like everything that they do works out. And they're not doing anything. They're, 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 not, they're not people of character and integrity. They're doing what they want to do. And every time they turn around, life is great. And yet you are doing what God has called you to do. You're trying to be obedient to God. And every time you turn around, there's another wall. There's another struggle. There's another, another difficulty. There's another impossibility. And it's just not fair. It's just not right. Maybe you're doing everything right in your marriage. You feel like you're doing everything right, but yet the relationship still struggles. You're doing everything right in, in, in trying to adopt, and every phone call you get is not now. It's not now. Maybe you're, maybe you're going above and beyond in your work, and you're, and you're taking care of business, and you're a person of integrity, and every time a promotion comes up, it goes to someone else that's cutting corners. Maybe you've been praying and praying and praying for your kid that's far from God and they're still far from God. Maybe you're a student and you've busted it for four years in high school and you've got the grades and you've got the test scores and the one place you want to go into, the one college you want to go to says no. Why? You're doing everything right. You're doing everything right, but yet there's a wall. There's an impossible wall in front of you. So what is your wall? What is the wall that you're dealing with right now? What is the struggle in front of you? What is the impossibility in front of you right now? I love this story because I love to look at how the Israelites handled this. Okay. How did the Israelites handle this situation? Let's pick up in Exodus 14. As Pharaoh approached the people of Israel, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, okay, they cried to the Lord, but then they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. And listen to this. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. The Israelites begin to ask this question. They begin to ask this question. When we face the wall, we ask why? Why did you, why'd you bring me here? Why did you bring me here? I've done everything right. Why am I here at this wall right now? Why did you bring me to this wall? Do you remember last week, and if you were here, the message, um, Jeremy was talking about how the dialogue between Moses when he was at the burning bush and God, and every time God would say something, Moses would um, say, well, why, God, why can't we do it this way? Why can't we? Do? And he basically, Moses wied God to frustration and anger, okay? Um, and if you have kids, you know what that was. Um, so here it's kind of turned around on Moses because now Moses is the leader and the people of Israel are whying him to a point of frustration. He's whied them to a point of frustration. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why did you bring us out here to die? Why have you brought us here to deal with this? Now, here's the funny part is they weren't griping when they were walking out of Egypt, were they? They weren't griping when they were, they were being freed from slavery. They weren't griping at all, but they started complaining when they hit the wall. That's what happens so often in our lives. When life gets difficult, when we come up against a wall and we begin to struggle, 
the first thing that we do is we desire to go back to where we're familiar to, with. Did you see how, what they did here? They wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to our comfort zone. As soon as we face the wall, we want our comfort zone. When the Israelites saw the Red Sea, when the Israelites saw the Red Sea, they saw the impossible. But when God saw the Red Sea, he saw huge possibilities. You ever been around a person that just is positive all the time? They, just, they, they see stuff and they're like, oh, we can handle this. This is great. I don't like those people, man. They get on my nerve. You know, they just, they, they just see the glass and it's got half full. And I'm thinking, no, it's half empty. Quit thinking that way. This is what's going on right here. The people are looking at this situation and say, look at that wall. We'll never make it past that wall. And God's going, look at that wall. Isn't that wall amazing? Look at the possibilities. They questioned. They said, why? Now, here's what I want you to understand. It is okay to ask God why. There's absolutely nothing wrong with asking why. But when you ask God a question, you need to wait for the answer. But the Israelites did not wait. They said why, and immediately they came up with their solution. They came up with their solution, their answer to the wall. You know what their answer was? Moses, leave us alone. Let us go back to Egypt. Leave us alone. Let us go back to slavery. Let us wave the white flag when the Egyptians come. We'll, get, we'll just walk back, and they can lead us in their chariots, and we'll, just, we'll, we'll be okay. We'll just go back there. They did not wait for God's solution. How many times in our life do we come up against a wall and our first thought is, can I climb that wall? Can I get around that wall? Can I knock down that wall? Can I dig underneath that wall? How can I fix this wall? And instead of asking God, why is that wall there? We begin to try to solve the problem ourselves. I believe it's okay to ask God why, but when we ask God why, we need to stop and we need to wait for that answer. We need to wait for what the answer is. Why would God lead the Israelites to a wall? Why would God lead the Israelites to a place where on one side is the Red Sea and on the other side is Pharaoh's army? Why would God do that? Why would God lead you to a place where you're facing a wall and you're doing everything right? You're doing everything right. I'm one of those cause and effect people. I like, if, if I do this, I'm gonna get this. I like you to work within my system, okay? If, if I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take care of my car, my car's gonna take care of me, all right? I'm gonna pay my bills. I'm gonna keep my electricity on and get good credit, all right? If I'm gonna treat my boss right. My boss is gonna take care of me, okay? I have this cause and effect. If I do A, I'm gonna get B. This is tough because when we do A, we don't get B. When we do what we're supposed to do, we get a wall. And in my mind, I'm thinking, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. Because I'm holding up my end of the bargain. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, God. But yet I'm still facing the wall. Let me tell you this, guys. If you don't hear anything else today, this is what I want you to hear. God does nothing by mistake. Everything God does has a reason behind it. If you are next to a wall and God has led you there, it is there on purpose. God doesn't do anything without a reason behind it. Why do I face the impossible situation? And I think there's two answers here. And the first one is this, the wall lets God show up. The wall that we face in our life lets God show up. Look at the scripture. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory. Now look at that part right there. I'm hardening Pharaoh's heart. He's gonna come after you. I planned this. God's telling Moses, I planned this. I planned this wall. It's part of the plan. And the reason is, is to display my glory so he can show up through Pharaoh and his whole army. And after this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. God leads us 
to a wall so that he can show up. Here's the crazy part. If, if, you're, if you're at a wall and you can solve the problem of the wall, who gets the credit? We do, don't we? But if you come against a wall and you have no solution and you can't fix the problem and it gets fixed, who gets the credit? God. God does that so he can show up and he can get the glory. One of the driving forces behind Grace Fellowship is we want to see God do something in the walls of Grace Fellowship and in the community around Grace Fellowship that cannot be explained by anything else that, but God did it. If we can explain it by something we did, we get the credit. But when we say God did it, he gets the credit. He leads us to the wall so that he can take care of the wall. He leads us to the impossible wall so that he can make it possible. So he gets the credit. When we see the wall and we say no way, God sees the wall and he makes a way. He makes a way. Why else does he lead us to the wall? He leads us to the wall to help us grow up. He leads us to the wall so he can show up and he leads us to the wall so we can grow up. Look at the scripture. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid, okay? <laughs> Put yourself in the situation, okay? You're, you're, you're there. Red Sea, army closing in, okay? You're stuck. Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch. Yeah, God, sure. The Lord will rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Yeah. See, army. Yeah, I'm going to be putting up my hammock and chilling. Okay. I'm stressing out. I'm stressing out. So why does God bring us to that point? Why does God bring us to that point? Because he wants us to, to grow and, and grow up in our relationship with him and begin to trust him. He doesn't want us to stress out. He's forcing our hand. When you come up against the wall and you don't have any other options, he's going to push you to the point where you have to trust him. And here's the crazy cool part, guys. Whenever you trust God in this situation, it makes the next situation easier to trust him. The next time you face a wall, the wall's going to look just a little bit smaller. It may be bigger, but your God is bigger this time. He wants us to grow our faith. We need to grow our faith. We need to trust him that when we're up against the wall that he led us up against, he's got it. He wants to grow our faith he wants to grow us up. He wants us to, to grow in such a way that we trust him. We follow that. Another thing that he wants us to do is this. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants us to be like Jesus. Uh, I don't know where you are today, but one of the things that God wants for you more than, more than anything is for you to know him. He wants you to know him and he, he, wants to, he wants you to have a relationship with him. And if, you're already, if you already have that relationship with him, he wants to grow that relationship. But one of the things he wants to do is lead you to a point where you have a relationship with him. And he wants you to be more like his son. Look at Galatians 5. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Okay, he wants to begin to develop inside of us the character of Christ. He wants to begin to develop inside of us an understanding of who we are in Christ. And when God leads us to the wall, he wants us to become and he wants us to grow and he wants us to let him mold us and make us into who he wants us to be. Look at this, look at this part of the very first part. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Is it our responsibility to produce the fruit in our life? No. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to pr produce that fruit in our lives. All we are supposed to do is cooperate. 
We're supposed to come alongside and work with. Instead of fighting the wall, what if we cooperated with the wall? What if we begin to let the wall develop inside of us the character of Christ? What if we begin to let the wall help us grow up? And instead of fighting the wall and getting frustrated with the wall and getting angry with the wall and trying to figure out how a way to get around the wall, we decided, you know what, just like he said to the, to the Israelites, stay calm. I got this. What if you just needed to stay still and you needed to cooperate with the wall and let the wall begin to develop inside of you the character of Christ? Too often we fight the wall. We go against the wall. And instead of just asking why, it's okay to ask why the wall's there, but instead of just stopping at that question, ask God, what are you trying to do in, in me? What are you trying to grow in me? What do I need to learn from the wall? Because here's the crazy thing, guys. If you don't learn it, if you don't learn it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to keep coming back to a wall until you learn it. Because God's objective is to help you be more like his son. Look at this statement. God leads us to walls so he can show up and we can grow up. You want to know why God leads us to walls in our life? Why we can do everything that we're supposed to do. We're, we're doing everything that God's asked us to do, but yet we still hit the wall. It's so that he can show up and we can grow up. He has a reason. He has a purpose for that every time. I want to wrap up this morning just real quick. There's three things I want to share with you that I feel like if you, and one of them's a question. I want you to, as you, as you come up against your wall, whatever your wall is, okay, we all have different walls, but when you come up against your wall, the first thing I want you to do is ask yourself this, what can I learn? What can I learn? Not how do I get through, not how do I make it go away, but what can I learn from this wall? And, and one of the things that you need to learn from the wall is you need to learn if the wall's there because of God or if the wall's there because of you. Because if it's there because of you, then you need to figure out what mistake you made so you don't do it again. But if you're led there by God, you need to ask God, what do I need to learn from this situation? Instead of being quick to get out of the situation, you stop and you wait and you say, okay, God, work on me in this situation. Maybe, maybe you're at the wall because God wants you to be a better husband. Maybe you're at the wall because God wants you to be a better wife. Maybe you're at the, at the, at the wall because God wants you to be a better dad or a better mom. Maybe you're at the wall because God wants you to be a better son or a better daughter. Maybe you're at the wall because God wants you to be a better boss or a better employee, a better teacher, a better coach, a better nurse, a better doctor, a better friend, a better neighbor. Why does God have you at the wall? It's not by accident. There's a reason. And don't be so quick to get through the wall that you miss out on what God wants to do in you. The next thing is this. We need to wait on God. We need to wait on God. You know, just like he said just a second ago, don't force the issue. Let God be God. Let him do his thing instead of you trying to play God. That's kind of difficult, isn't it? Because we like to play God, don't we? We like to control our situation. We like to control our circumstances. And God's saying, no, just wait. Let me be God. Because when God leads us to this point and we wait on him, he begins to show up and he begins to show off. And we begin to see him for the mighty God that he is. And whenever God does something amazing in your life, people around you begin to look. They know while you're facing and they begin to see what God's doing in your life and you know who gets the credit? God. 
The crazy cool part about this is that the way that God shows up when we wait is never the way we would draw it out. Sometimes God wants us to grow. I can remember several years ago, Christy and I were in a, in a, in a situation. I was a student pastor at a church, and, <clears throat> and um, I didn't exactly handle myself very well, so I left. I, I got, I left. Um, and, um, and I went to another church, and a similar situation started arising. And, and, and God had led me to this church, and there was no doubt in my mind that God led me to this church. And I'm up against this wall. And, and Christy looked at me. She goes, I don't know what God's trying to teach you. You better learn it. I'm tired of this. <laughs> What's he trying to teach you? What is he trying to teach you? And this leads us to the final thing. Walk through. At some point in time, we don't sit there and wait anymore. But when God tells us, we begin to walk. And we take action. Look at the scripture. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Why are you crying to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. On dry ground. And here's the cool part. Whenever we wait and we let him teach us, and at some point in time, he's going to tell us to take action. Now, if I was there, I would say, okay, God's going to provide us a big boat. Maybe, maybe God's going to give us a zip line that all of us can, zoom, or a bridge maybe, maybe even a bridge, but dry ground. Who would have ever prayed that? Who would ever thought that? Most of the time when God shows up in this situation, when you're standing up against the wall, it's not something you thought of. And, and they walked across on dry ground. And, and I believe that whenever the wall, whenever the wall came down and the water split and they begin to take steps, the first step was a step of faith, but the second step was just as big of faith. Because think with me for just a second. Moses was moving 600,000 Israelites. He was leading 600,000 Israelites. Just to kind of think through that, that is six sold out capacities of Jerry Dome. 600,000 people, and he's moving them through on dry ground. And as they're walking, they're on either side is the sea. And as they're walking through, they're looking at the fish, the dolphins, the sharks. And, 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 and they're seeing this as it's a first walk through aquarium ever. It's the coolest thing. But then I want you to think this way. What if you're carrying an 18-month-old baby? And as you're walking through, you're thinking at any point in time, this water can come back down. You're helping your 93-year-old mom and she's walking very slowly and you're trying to hurry her up because the, the Egyptians are coming and you're trying to encourage her, come on, come on, mom, come on, grandma, let's go. Or maybe you're a mom and you have twins and they're running from side to side, poking their finger in the water, trying to grab fish and you're just trying to get them moving. You're just trying to, come on, man, we got to go. Knowing that every step that you take, you're thinking, if this starts coming down, can I make it back? The next step, if I'm, if I'm here, can I make it back? If I run, can I make it back? And then you get to that point, and you're right in the middle. And you're like, I'm here. Every step that they took was a step of faith. And guys, whenever God leads us to a wall, a wall that we have no control over, and he tells us which direction to go, every step that you take is a step of faith. And that's what God's trying to do in us. He wants us to take that step of faith. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to know what our next step is. So what wall are you facing right now? What is your wall? Is it a, is it a, a marriage relationship that you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing and the other side's not holding up there into the bargain? 
Is it, is it that, is it that desire to foster and adopt and you keep getting the phone call? Not yet. Is it, is it that job situation that you are doing everything right and you still get passed up for the promotion? Are you a student and you've got the grades and you've got the test scores and you want to get and you just keep getting the no? What is your wall right now? What is challenging you right now? What wall has God led you to? And how are you handling that wall? Because guys, God's at work. He didn't lead you to that wall on accident. He led you to that wall on purpose. And read this with me again. God leads us to the wall so he can show up and we can grow up. The walls that we face in our life, the walls that he leads us to, he leads us there so that he can get the credit when it's solved and that we can be more like Jesus when it's over. Guys, don't miss that. Don't fight through the wall so hard that you miss out on God getting the glory and you miss out on what God wants to do in your life. Don't miss out on that. We need to learn. We need to wait. And at some point in time, whatever it is, whatever it looks like, we need to start walking. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Uh, Father, I, I, I'm going to say this, but sometimes I don't like it. I'm going to thank you for the walls. Thank you for bringing us to, a, to places where we can't do anything except trust you. And Father, my desire for my life, my desire for Grace Fellowship, my desire for everybody in this room and watching online, Father, is that you would get us to a point that we trust you and we know that you got it and that we would have enough faith in you that we would take steps in the direction you lead us. Father, thank you for the walls in our life. Help us to learn and grow through them. It's in your son's precious name I pray, amen. Wow, what an important message for me to hear as like a certified member of the Wall Fighter Club. Uh, that, you know, sometimes God leads us to those walls on purpose in order for him to show up and for me to grow up. Uh, so as you know, next weekend is what? Who knows? Easter weekend. So in your seat, you will find two of these cool little invites. We want you to take these with you and invite somebody to come back with you next week. We will have service times on Saturday, April 3rd from four, at 4 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. And on Saturday is when the egg hunts are going down. So egg hunts will begin with a helicopter egg drop, and they are going to be at 3.15 and immediately following the 5.30 service. So that is going to be awesome. And on Sunday, we will have our regular service times at 9 30 and 11 and you are going to want to get here early because there's going to be a chance to win some cool prizes i don't know what they are but i think they're cool so if you are here in our audience remember that ushers are going to be dismissing us by section and by row and if you are online we hope to see you online again next week or even better join us here at our paradise campus on saturday at 4 or 5 30 or on sunday at 9 30 or 11 y'all have a great week